Have you been hurt while you're playing pickleball? If you have, you're in the right place because today we're going to talk about injury and first of all, preventing injury. <laughs> uh, so what do we do before we get hurt? And then we'll talk about some things that we can do uh, once we've been hurt. And uh, joining me for this conversation is going to be Dr. Ellen Rosenthal. Uh, Ellen is a DPM and he is affectionately known as Dr. Pickleball. So you are in for a real treat today. My name is CJ Johnson and my uh, background is in, uh, I'm, a, I'm a coach. Hang on one second. I'm gonna, all right. Okay, there we go. Sorry, we got a little bit of background noise. Ellen has a very squeaky chair on that other end. So I, I cut the cut the audio there for just a second. But uh, anyway, um, I was saying my background is in health and wellness and uh, I have the Better Pickleball YouTube channel. And so welcome. I am passionate about helping people stay healthy and fit because one of the things that I would share with you is when I first came to Pickleball, I uh, got my first injury. I'd been a golf pro for years and years and years, and I had my first case of a uh, golfer's elbow, and I got it actually from pickleball, not from, uh, not from uh, uh, golf. So uh, that's what we're here to do. So it's gonna be your chance to ask Alan some uh, questions, and we're gonna get started in that with uh, in just a couple minutes. But I did want to let you know everything that's going on. I know that a lot of you are opening up. I've seen that some cart courts are open. Um, I ask that you uh, um, uh, be cautious as you start to get out there in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is making sure that you're taking care of your body. Did want to let you know about a couple of upcoming live shows. Uh, we have uh, next week, we've got Dottie Berry and Coach Dottie B. She's going to come on and she's going to talk about feeling good. And if you've forgotten what it's like to feel good, you're going to want to make sure that you tune in for that. And then on the 19th of May, we are going to have Dave Weinbach, Dave the Badger Weinbach, and he'll be coming on to uh, answer all of your questions as well. In fact, I'm going to continue to go live for the next uh, two weeks uh, until I go back to a monthly show starting in June. So I always do the first Tuesday of every month. And we will go back to monthly then. But in the meantime, we've got some great guests for you. And uh, I have lovely Dale Cassell over in the chat today. So Dale, uh, thank you so much for helping. If you have questions today, make sure that you put a Q or uh, the word question in front of the uh, in front of your chat so that she knows it's a question and she will put those questions through to me. So uh, there we go. All right. I think we kind of have everything all cleaned up and we're all ready to go. So uh, with that, I'm going to just give me just a second here and I am going to bring in. Hello, Alan. How are you today? I am great. And you? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, you have seen Alan on this channel before. We've done uh, a couple of different uh, uh, video on demand. We also, he was a guest on the Pickleball Summit. So I, I, instead of welcome, I really should say welcome back, Alan. Thank you. It's always now, good to be here. So tell me, how have, I, I know that a lot of people are starting to open up. I mean, what are, Alan's in Connecticut. I'm a, So we got a West Coast, East Coast thing here, right? I'm on the West Coast. I'm in Lake Tahoe. Alan's in Connecticut. How are things changing right now in Connecticut? Are people starting to play pickleball again? And what what are you uh, saying? We're still, no, no, we're very close to New York. So we're, we're not. Okay. All um, right. But the USPA came out with the uh, rules for us to how to start. In fact, you share with me how to play singles. <laughs> they did. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're right. We have a couple of different things just so that you know some of the resources that uh, that are available. Uh, and Dale, perhaps you can share this link as well. Uh, the US APA came out with a COVID related document about uh, practicing safe distancing during pickleball. I did send that out last uh, week to my uh, to the people who are on my weekly newsletter. And I also came out with a video last uh, Saturday about skinny singles. And uh, it was Alan and I had talked about it. I had some skinny single stuff on the, the channel. 
And I, I know we're probably going to be playing some singles for a while. And so I encourage you to take a look at that video and to try some skinny singles because it's super fun. Super, super I have fun. been hitting the ball against the uh, garage wall. <laughs> That's the extent of my pickleball right now. That is. And what have you noticed with your body? Because I know you're a pretty avid player. And so this has been a long layout for you. So as you started hitting the ball against the against the wall in the garage, what did you notice were you, with your body? Was it tighter? Was it a little harder to do? I think it's, it's definitely tighter. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't been as active as we want to be. Um, I mean, I've been doing resistance training in the office and taking walks with my wife uh, whenever we can. But I'm still, you know, my office is still open, so uh, I'm busy with that. Yeah, yes. I am going to do my first parade into golf tomorrow, so that should be interesting. We are okay. allowed to play golf. Okay, all right. Yeah, golf kind of has its, that's my old sport, right? Golf kind of has its its right. natural so, social distancing. So, so um, Alan, before we jump into this, uh, I, I, what I'd like everybody to, 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 perhaps they haven't seen you on the channel previously. So if you would just take a couple minutes and tell everybody who you are and what you do. Okay, I'm a podiatrist, sports podiatrist in uh, Richfield, Connecticut. My office is the Advanced Foot Care Center. Uh, I've been practicing since uh, uh, 1979. I'm a member of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. I did give a lecture this fall on pickleball injuries to my colleagues. I am also an IPTPA uh, level one instructor. Um, and I was a former high school tennis player. Uh, I love pickleball. I've been playing for close to more than 10 years now. I play in competition. I'd like to do better. <laughs> That's why I watch the pickleball channel, a, a, a better pickleball. And uh, I'm also a consultant for uh, Tyrol Pickleball Shoes. Yeah, and if you missed it, make sure uh, that you go back to Alan was on day three and uh, Kevin Huckle, who is the CEO of uh, Tyrell Shoes and Alan had, uh, it was a great discussion on pickleball shoes and preventing injury because I know that uh, Alan has worked in conjunction with them uh, to develop the Tyrol pickleball shoe. And I, I found it really fascinating because I thought, well, a court shoe is a court shoe is a court shoe. And that's not the case. <laughs> um, the movement for pickleball is a little bit different, as it turns out. Who, who would have thought? <laughs> you know, I learned some things, too, from Kevin. So uh... <laughs> Fantastic. It was really worthwhile. It was. So make sure you go back and check that out. Now, we're going to be, uh, uh, what we want to do today is, uh, first of all, is a couple of things. And I have to show this to you because, yeah, as we know, Alan is a Alan is a doctor, right? And so we need to make sure that you see this. Here's the disclaimer, right? Uh, he is not treating anything. Read through the disclaimer. He he will answer questions kind of in a general way. He can't, can't answer anything specific. But should you decide to reach out to Alan at the end, we'll have some information on um, how you could connect with him in terms of professional services. So, how to get that little how to get that little disclaimer out of the way there. In Alan. fact, you could put on and in this day and age, I do telehealth that have been doing. You know, it is covered by health insurance. So, I'm getting better at uh, Zoom. <laughs> He is. I'm telling you, he's coming into it with the technology. Um, so I even Alan, threw a virtual birthday party for my wife this weekend. Ah, and that that is cool. Did you did you have a good time? Yes, we did because I had my grandchildren on it. It was great. Ah, uh, that's fantastic. So, all right. So let's go ahead and get into this. And I think one of the first things that Alan wanted to share with everybody. Um, we're going to start this out by talking about avoiding some pickleball injuries, right? Because as Alan said, many people haven't been out on the court for a while. Uh, some people have been doing some things inside, but maybe a lot of people have been a little bit more of a couch potato recently. Uh, so we, he wants to start out with some statistics that he, he brought to my attention today. And I got to tell you, they got my attention big. So, Alan, why don't you start by going through all of those, if you would, please? 
Okay, so of all the pickleball-related injuries, the most common was a strain. Of, this was a survey, I'm sorry, that was done in emergency departments throughout the United States, and it was printed up in the Journal of Emer Emergency of this past year. So see this, uh, how it, the number of pickleball injuries presenting to the emergency department has grown. One of the reasons that could be is because of the rapid rise of the of the sport in recent years. There's more people playing. But what I found interesting, of all these pickleball-related injuries, the most common was a strain or a sprain or a fracture. And the most common area of injury was to the lower extremity. Injuries related to the upper extremity counted for only a quarter of the injury, and injuries to the head and neck only accounted for 16%. Furthermore, they said the vast majority of pickleball-related injuries treated in emergency departments resulted in the patient being released after their examination and treatment, 88%, which shows that the majority of the injuries were not serious enough to cause hospitalization. And especially now with the COVID, all podiatrists and uh, offices are open, and we can help the uh, busy ERs by uh, taking care of these pickleball patients that do get injured when they start back. I can't hear you. There we go. I always mute my mic and sometimes I forget to take it, take, take it off, but thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, when yeah. we went when we went through and we were talking about some of those statistics as we were getting prepared for this, I, I was a bit surprised that lower body injuries were more prevalent than the upper body injury. I think that was the same thing that surprised you, correct, Alan? Right. Well, so why uh, do you th why do you think that is? I think first of all, it's the uh, age group that that is playing. They're not warming up consistently. Uh, they're playing possibly on hard courts around the country, which is a lot more abusive on the lower extremity than obviously the upper extremity. The, you know, this may differ from tennis where there probably is a lot of upper extremity tennis elbow type uh, problems because of the, you know, it's, I think tennis is a little bit more violent when you, you know, you hit a racket against a uh, tennis ball and um, you also can play on clay courts in tennis. And here we're playing either on a hard uh, court or a gym floor, which uh, it's not very forgiving. And people are probably still not wearing the proper shoes. You know, it's funny, I, and I've said this a multitude of times, and, and I'm stealing it actually from Laura Fenton Cavanda. Um, gee, we're out there playing for hours and hours on a concrete car court. What could go wrong? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So let's first, before we get into some questions, and you're welcome to start putting your questions into the chat, either put a cue or a question in there before them. But before we get into that, um, let's talk a little bit about right now, a lot of people have been on a layoff. Prime time for injury, right? I mean, because they're yes. going to go out, they're probably going to play hours and hours on end, and they're going to bring some bad habits back with them. So Alan, why don't you start us off by saying, what are the things that people can begin to do as they go back to the courts to help them to avoid getting hurt in the first place? I think one of the things that we talked about this, and I know you have videos on this, is uh, stretching. And not just passive stretching, you want an active stretching. You may want to, before you start playing, do a little jogging around the court. You want to do some maybe windmills and uh, things for your upper extremity, too. Uh, if it's cold, like here in the Northeast and we start playing, I wouldn't go out in shorts right away. I would wear either uh, warm-ups, get a little sweat going, um, and then, you know, take off the uh, warm-ups. Maybe even wear um, compression uh, uh, so uh, socks, and that, that might help. I wouldn't rush out and I would take it easy first couple of days. 
you know, Alan's got a great point, and and I'm going to segue into uh, we have a playlist for you that we will put uh, in the show notes. Dale has it actually, so she'll put it in the. It's both in the show notes as well as it's going into the chat, and it has some of those dynamic stretching that Alan's talking about. So things you can do to warm up the body and huff and puff and get ready. And and I have to say, I went out. You know, I'm pretty fit. I I ski. I work out a lot. Uh, I went out the other day with my drilling partner and we played uh, uh, singles you know we drilled for a little while and then we played singles and I swore by the time we were leaving I thought oh my god I've been here for four hours I can't believe this it was less than two hours um, which, which is a very long time but I gotta tell you my body felt like it was four hours so I, I think we. the other we, thing is most of us oh. go ahead you know, most of us are used to playing doubles whether it be mixed or men's or women's doubles, and if you're gonna start playing singles, I'd learn how to play skinny singles first. And it'll get you skinny. <laughs> exactly. In fact, it was fun it was funny. Um I don't know if you saw the conversation, Alan, over on Pickleball List, uh, Frank Anthony Davis, we were talking about singles. We were talking about the single skinny, uh, skinny singles video. And for those of you who don't know, Frank Anthony Davis is probably, I don't know, the maybe the third, fourth, he's certainly in the top 10 singles players in the world. And somebody asked him, how do you get to the point where you play more skinny, where you play more singles, right? Where you feel fit enough. And one of the things he said is, don't forget, um, playing an hour and a half to two hours worth of singles is like playing uh, four hours worth of doubles. So uh, be careful as you start to get back out on the court. Uh, you Alan. might you might even want to see your physician, you know, if you're an older player, you don't know if you have cardio problems and there's a big difference playing singles and doubles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alan, let's talk a little bit about so we talked about some stretching. Let's talk a little bit about what are some of the specific types of or, or specific areas, not necessarily specific stretches, because I know it's hard to do without um, being able to demonstrate. But what are some of the areas as we get ready to play that we should make sure we're stretching before and after we play pickleball? Well, since I do mostly lower extremity, I'm gonna start with the lower extremity. Uh, you wanna stretch out your hamstrings. You wanna stretch up your calf muscles. You wanna you know, stretch out your plantar fascia. So just really work yourself down. And I, I assume the same for the upper extremity. Absolutely. So perfect. I, I'm, we have, it, it, the biggest thing is this, at least give yourself, you know, five minutes before, five minutes after, and to start to stretch. Now, Alan, what are I'm going to get a lot of, yeah. go ahead. No, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I'm going to get a lot of grief from people because I'm not a great stretcher myself. <laughs> You got to practice what I'm you sorry. preach. You got to practice what you I preach, know, right? I know. <laughs> right? Okay. So, Alan, maybe it, it, what you could do is it, let's talk about a couple of uh, specific injuries. In fact, I know that I have one question that came up, and this this is a question that comes up pretty free, fr frequently. Boy, that was easy to say, wasn't it? Um, you want me to guess it? <laughs> yes, go ahead. You guess it. He hasn't seen it. What is Plantar it? Plantar fasciitis. You got Plantar it. Plantar fasciitis. It, <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. Plantar fasciitis. So how about if we touch on what are some of the things? First of all, let's talk about prevention of plantar fasciitis. Let, let's let that be number okay. one. Stretching, icing, wearing the proper shoe. Now, if you get an injury to it, um, uh, you may want to take an anti-inflammatory. If it's a continual problem, you want to see a professional so that they can recommend the uh, proper treatments. And treatment depends on where the pain is. And there's a lot of things that can masquerade as plantar fasciitis. There could be a, uh, an aroma type problem in the foot, um, tarsal tunnel. There could be a stress fracture going on in the heel. Um, there could be a tear in the plantar fascia, and I've had that numerous times. 
so Alan, let's back up just a little bit. Cause I guess I made the assumption sure. because I have suffered with this <laughs> and you have seen it a lot, right? We're making the assumption that people know what plantar fasciitis is, right? So maybe why don't you back up a little bit, tell everybody what it is and how they may know that it's becoming a problem for them. What, what are some of the things that they may feel? Because if you could see my, my model of the foot, the plantar fascia runs from the heel to the ball of foot. It has three bands, a medial, central, and lateral bands. I kind of explain to my patients like a string on a bow. So usually the patient complains the first thing in the morning when they get out of bed, they get pain in the, in the arch and the heel. What I tell those patients is don't jump out of bed so quickly and do a mild stretch by just bringing your foot towards your face. Now, if this pain continues and the ice, the anti-inflammatories and the stretching doesn't work, that's when you should see a professional. He can maybe give you a night splint, he can give you something to wear in your shoe. He can look at your shoes. He can give anti-inflammatories. He can give you an injection necessarily. I use a laser in my office. There's something called shockwave uh, therapy. And the last resort, which is really, I, I feel in, uh, is it would be surgery, but 75 to 80% of the time, uh, the conservative treatments work. Okay. So, so how you've talked a little bit about, you know, how to treat it and a little bit about how to avoid it. I, we had a question about orthotics, right? Are, are orthotics one of the things that can help with plantar fasciitis or is that a whole different ball game with orthotics? Well, all of these problems that go on in lower extremity are called overuse syndromes. So the plantar fascia is being overused by playing so often. So yes, what I tell patients to do, I can either, I tape them up with kinesiology tape and so they can play. If that works and an over-the-counter orthotic might work, if that doesn't work, a podiatrist, a sports podiatrist can make a custom device. Um, not all these over-the-counter devices will work because there's no real scientific biomechanical uh, basis on an individual patient. It's not casted. It's not custom made. So uh, yes, an orthotic would help. So is an, or is an over, uh, over the counter orthotic better than nothing? Or are you just better off biting the bullet and going to see you and getting an orthotic done? No, I think uh, they wouldn't be selling them if they didn't work. Okay. okay. But it, if the, everybody's foot is different, so every orthotic is not going to work for every foot. So if you have a high arch foot, you need more shock absorption. If you have a foot that pronates or is flat footed, you may need more support. When a podiatrist does an examination, he watches not only the patient walking, he measures if there's one leg longer or shorter than the other. He casts the patient. So it's an individual custom device. For that patient's foot. You know, it's funny, Alan and I were talking about this, oh, what was it, like three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, because we were talking about skiing. Alan is a skier as well. We have a lot of sports in common, right? We're, we're, ta in, we're talking about different orthotics for different sports. I, I, I have a completely different orthotic for my ski boot than, uh, than I do for my court shoes, and um, they're built to do different things, correct? Correct, and that's another point. I actually listened to a lecture on uh, on Friday afternoon uh, from uh, a doctor, and there are sport orthotics that are made for individual sports. A skier needs a different uh, orthotic than a tennis player or pickleball player. A golfer needs a different orthotic. A dress shoe for everyday wear, you may need another orthotic. The different, the reason being is all these sports have different gait patterns. A golfer needs it so that he can rotate his foot. A tennis player versus a runner or a pickleball player goes laterally more than, you know, forward all the time. The shoes are different. So the orthotic has to accommodate the shoe. A ski boot, ice skating uh, boot is quite different than, you know, an athletic shoe. 
So the sports are individualized and you need the proper orthotic. Exactly, exactly. So if you have questions, you should go and see a professional. <laughs> right. Per okay, so so we talked a little bit now about, before we leave plantar fasciitis, we had one more question coming from Carol. Uh, hi, Carol, how are you today? Hope you are having a fantastic day. She comes to see us very often here on this channel. Um, Carol wanted to, so how do you stretch the plantar fascia? What, what, what would you recommend? They make devices that you can get. There's something called Pro Stretch. And that will help stretch not, not only plantar fasciitis, but some of the fibers from the Achilles and the muscle group in the back um, insert, uh, run together. So you want to stretch not only the plantar fascia, but you want to um, stretch at the Achilles uh, and uh, gastrocnemius muscle and soleus muscle. One of the things you can do is just take a ice, uh, freeze a, uh, a, a Coke can or something and just roll your foot over it. Um, Depending on the size of the foot depends on what you would use, but uh, that would help after playing. That helped me a lot. I, I, I have to say that was like one of my favorite and you know, I, I, I don't suffer with plantar fasciitis uh, anymore. Uh, it, I really got mine from distance running, but boy, I'll tell you, Carol, when I took that uh, frozen bottle and would just roll it, I still do that sometimes because just plain and simple, my feet are tired, especially now um, when I noticed I, I'm doing not just at the courts, but I'm starting to do more pickleball movement. I'm out of the ski boots. My feet are tired. <laughs> it feels good. Yeah, uh, it's good to be back. <laughs> Hey, Alan, one of my favorite stretches, and this is hard to describe, um, but one of my favorite stretches, what do they call it? In, yo in yoga, I think they call it yoga toes, right? So you're done on all fours. Is that a good stretch for plantar fasciitis where you kind of have your toe tucked underneath you? Oh, I'm not that. I, I usually tell patients to do wall push-ups with the knees straight and bent after they've warmed up, more of a static stretching. Or taking, you can even take a, barrel band or something and put it around your 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 foot and and fold back but they make you know things to stretch like the, a night split that a doctor could prescribe um they also make this contraption called the pro stretch that i know some of the tennis pros uh that had it utilize cool so one more question on plantar fasciitis. I know I saw it in here. Actually, we had two more questions on it. Um, one... They can also go to the, my website. Those videos are there. Yes, those videos are there. And, um, you know, the other thing I know you talked about, well, you know what, we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's finish up okay. this one. Um, so Question came in from Dale. She said, I've heard that it's okay to play with plantar fasciitis if you can handle the discomfort. Do you agree with that? Uh, you're, I've had so many patients that have actually torn their plantar fascia without doing anything. In that case, if that happens, you're looking to be immobilized for, it can be six to eight weeks because you've actually torn it. Okay, so that's kind of being dicey. I, if, if you don't want to come to a doctor, you could try an over-the-counter device or, or you're even uh, kinesiology tape it. But, you know, if it's going on for a while, it's, it's ridiculous on my mind, anyhow, to continue. It's, you're just looking for a world of hurt, I think. So that brings up a great point. When is it time to see the doctor with plantar fasciitis? What are some of the dictators? If, if it's really hindering you, your play, if it's really hindering your play, it could be, a, you know, maybe two, three weeks after trying treating conservatively like we just talked about. Uh, if it's a continual issue, you just don't want it to go on. If a patient comes in, I don't have to make them an orthotic right away. I can teach them how to tape it. I can use my, I have a laser in my office that can uh, heal it. 
not every patient that has plantar fasciitis needs an orthotic, but you certainly don't want to keep continually doing it and, and tearing those fibers in the, uh, in the plantar fascia. And that's a great point. And, and I will say this though, plantar fasciitis kind of does have a way of knowing, letting you know when it's time. <laughs> it hurts. It's probably, oh yeah. It's probably the number one thing podiatrists see uh, as far as athletic injuries are concerned. Okay. All right. I think I thought I had, I thought I saw, oh, I do have one more before we leave plant. I knew there was one more and I couldn't see where it was. Um, <laughs> How can you tell if you have plantar fasciitis versus a tendon strain? Well, the plantar fascia is on the bottom of the foot. Like I explained, it runs from the heel to the ball of the foot. Um, you know what? The professional would have to examine you to see if there's other tendons involved. Uh, I mean, this, it's very possible, yes, there could be some uh, tendon involvement on the bottom of the foot of a uh, other tendons that could disguise itself as plantar fasciitis. So not everything on the bottom of the foot is plantar fasciitis. You can have cesphoiditis, you can have uh, a uh, back to nerve involvement, um, you can have a tear, you can have a stress fracture in the calcaneus. Um, there are a lot of things that go on the foot. But you're kind of saying, I think in general, right, that is when the over-the-counter measures that you described, right, that the the rest, the um, um, taping. ibuprofen, the, the taping, when those don't work, that's when it's really time to see a professional, correct? Yes. And why don't you tell people a little bit, you and I have talked at different points in times about taping. Why don't why don't you talk a little bit about taping and uh, that resource, those videos that you that you you told me about? No, it's it's really funny. Uh, we used to in podiatry just use uh, regular athletic tape and do what's called the low dice strapping. Now, ever since you see these volleyball players for years now and tennis players, etc., using kinesiology tape. There's some really good videos on how to utilize kinesiology tape on uh, the internet. The beauty of kinesiology tape is you can do it in a, in a versus athletic tape. Athletic tape wears out almost as soon as the patient walks out of my office. Where kinesiology tape, you can wear it depending on the brand and which my, uh, part, uh, kind you buy, can last at least three to five days. You can wear it showering um, and you can wear it swimming and, it's, and it doesn't wear out. And you don't have to put any kind of, uh, you used to have to use Pro Wrap underneath athletic tape and it can irritate the skin. Usually kinesiology tape will not. But they do tell you if you go to their sites how to utilize it and how to remove it and how to put it on what was that site i'm putting you on the spot what was that site that i know you, I, you know what i don't want to really recommend one to. company okay all right <laughs> all right it's kt tape but there are other brands too and uh, kt tape has a number of really good videos and i use it on myself uh i the only problem is i try and do my back and it's not the easiest thing. And my wife complains that I have to, she has to do it for me. So, but you know what? His wife is a nurse. So, I, <laughs> right? Nurse practitioner. <laughs> nurse practitioner. Yes. And, nurse practitioner. and tomorrow's her birthday, which is Nurses Day. Well, shout out to the missus. Uh, it'd be nice if she was online, but I think <laughs> she's watching. probably still working, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, no. She came. Well, I'm hoping she's watching. I have to show her how to use YouTube. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, I will say this. Alan sent me to that site. We're not sponsored by KT Tape, um, but he sent me to that site. I have used those videos. Uh, the videos on there are really self-explanatory. So if you're, you're, and I'm sure there might be other sources out there. I've just been to that one personally. So I can say it's, it's beneficial. It makes it very easy to do. Don't be afraid of trying it. 
Okay. So we've got a couple specific questions and I know you may or may not be able to answer them, but I'm going to throw them out there and you be the judge. So this comes from William Truscott. Hello, William. He comes, he's here often as well. We're glad you're here. So he says he had a perineal tear for over a year. He wore a boot at an orthopedic doc recommendation and it didn't help. He says he still plays and it hurts. Can I do further damage or is there another recommendation that you would have for him? Well, first of all, let's explain where the perineal muscles are. They come down the outside of the leg and they ins one inserts into the base of the fifth metatarsal. The other one runs and sends insertions into the foot. So, and there's different ways you can tear that. You can tear, there's a, what they call the perineal groove on the bottom of the foot, and then there's a perineal reciculum along the side of the foot. So without really examining him, I don't know what he did. I would have ordered probably an MRI, but treatment, an orthotic might help him quite a bit because what I could do on an orthotic is prop up that area of the foot so he isn't putting excessive strain when he twists that foot. Again, without examining him, it's, it's somewhat difficult. Sure, absolutely. But hopefully there, William, you've got a couple of additional options, maybe some things that you haven't yet tried. And even kinesiology taping, if you go to the, uh, the website, there is to, uh, I just remember a video on taping up the perineal muscle group. There you go. All right. Okay, let's see. This one's coming in from Cassandra Smith. I have been wearing shoes that were too narrow in the toes while playing. And she's now bought wider shoes. However, the smaller shoes have left calluses on both the big toes. How do you get rid of them? The calluses? Yes. That's easy. Come to your podiatrist. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we know that, you know, that's what we do. That's bread and butter for a podiatrist. We can make you more comfortable. One of the things about the Tyrol pickleball shoe that I like is it's wider in the toe box, but narrower in the heel. And it has a lot more um, support. You can also change the lacing pattern to, uh, to alleviate some of this ca uh, problems. Depends where the callus is to know exactly how to treat it. But the podiatrist can definitely make you more comfortable and you'll be walking out of the office pain free. There we go. Now, she brought up a great point because I think that a lot of times that people get the wrong kind of shoe, <laughs> right? They're, 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 well, they're... It's not only the shoe, it's the sock too. Okay, so maybe let's talk about this. Let's, how about a little bit on socks first? What What is, for playing pickleball, what should somebody consider when they're purchasing socks? They now pickleball socks. Thorlo came out, I'm giving plugs to all these companies. Thorlo makes a pickleball sock that is more cushioned in the forefoot and in the heel. Um, so that would help prevent um, blisters. Uh, you want a sock that has a combination. You don't want just cotton because cotton gets wet. Same like wool does for skiing. You want a synthetic material so that you don't, um, it's not, it doesn't maintain the moisture because then you're looking at athlete's foot infections. So you want an athletic sock. Okay. And you said that brand, that specific pickleball sock was Thor Thorlow. Thorlo. Okay. All right, cool. Let's see. So we're going to move up the leg just a little bit now. So Wade Partridge, hello, uh -oh. Wade. How are you doing? He says he has patella tendonitis from playing. Um, maybe you can explain to people what patella tendonitis is. And he says, are there any stretches or icing or what would be some of the, the recommendations for that? All right. First of all, we have to distinguish this from contra. It's if he has patella tendonitis or contramalacia patella, there's two different things there. Underneath the patella, there's a, uh, a tendon. If that's irritated, uh, icing it, anti-inflammatories. If it's contramalacia, 
you, uh, which is a um, irritation under the patella, which is a kneecap, could be from a biomechanical uh, problem. Women have uh, what's called a greater Q angle. Their, their legs are more like a slant down, uh, you know, their hips and such. And so what happens is, especially if the foot pronates, rolls in, it puts more pressure on the, uh, the patella and you can get uh, contralation patella. The way of treating that is a series of exercises uh, and also a possible use of an orthotic to put the foot in a better uh, position. If a patient complains of like sitting down for long periods of time, um, and if I press that patella in a certain way, that's one of the, I have to really examine where he has the, the pain exactly. I mean, the knee is complicated. Okay. But what I'm hearing you say are there are some stretches and some things that can be done. It just really depends on what's going on with your body. And that's when you And also kinesiology it. tape. There's taping to hold the patella in place. There's okay. also uh, something called a show pat, C-H-O-P-A-T, which is a, like a tube that they put around the bottom of the knee. But again, it depends on what the problem actually is. Okay. So if it's really bothering you, it's time to go see somebody like Alan <laughs> or, or go see Alan. You can see Alan through televisits as well now. I mean, that's the new latest, the, I mean, not the latest thing in medicine. I, I've it's been fun around with for it. a while. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's been around for a while. And just in the, the, the environment we're in, it's, I know Alan and I have been talking offline about this. It's becoming more and more popular for him and, and so there, there are things that you can do. And it's a great time if you're off the courts right now and you're resting, it's a great time to take care of some of these nagging things so that they're not nagging when you get back to playing. Okay, let's see. All right, we're still, we're still gonna be on the knees. So I have mild arthritis in both knees from playing pickleball. What are some knee exercises that could help to relieve the pain? Okay. You have to remember I'm a podiatrist and in my state, unfortunately, we don't treat the knee, but I mean, I do know any kind of exercise to really strengthen up uh, the knee, mu uh, the muscles around the, uh, the leg. Uh, I use for myself and I have knee problems. I have arthritis. I've been using a TheraBand uh, in my office every morning. I do uh, strengthening that way. Uh, for every four, four quadrants with the uh, TheraBand and to strengthen up my leg muscles. So. Uh, and, and you know what, one of the things too with, and, and I'm a personal trainer, right? So one of the things with uh, uh, the lower legs, moving them is helping, right? <laughs> even if your arthritis oh, yeah, oh, yeah. is, even if your arthritis does, it hurts like heck, getting out there and moving the joints, it's kind of like, think a Tin Man from the um, from the old Wizard of Oz movies, right? That that will definitely help to loosen them up. You know, also, every time you take a running, this has been documented, every time you take a running step, you put two to three times your body weight through those uh, legs and knees. So losing weight, obviously, is going to help. And it's a battle. <laughs> it is. Yeah, through. we talked about that. We talked about that a while ago. Uh, Ellen was helping me as I, you know, because I have a digital uh, weight management and fitness uh, class. And we were talking about that. I said, Alan, how much extra weight do you put on your your knees? And he, he and he, he went to his wife and we came up with the number. And uh, what was it for every five pounds? Like you said, three pounds of additional pressure to the leg. I believe Something is like what that. you said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so my goodness, it, you know, it's a lot. So five pounds really makes a difference in the pressure to- And especially since knees. we've been sitting for so long now, you gotta be careful. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, hopefully that helps you a little bit, Leonard. Um, let's see. Okay, talk about, we kind of, we touched a little bit on socks. Talk a little bit about a couple of the basics for uh, choosing a good shoe for pickleball. Okay. Uh, 
You want to make sure if I take off my shoes, I have a, a my Tyrol shoe on, and that might be easier. So one of the beauties of this shoe is it's got a long lacing system. It has something so you can uh, hook it up so you can uh, really cinch in your your ankle. You want a firm heel counter. You want a, a pattern on the bottom of the shoe that is made for a court surface because you're going laterally, not always forward. Tyro came out with a oh, – here I'm pitching – uh, a different sole for the shoe. You can see mine is pretty worn out. This I wear every day to the office. Another thing Tyrol did, and this goes back to the other question, they made a wider toe box, and they also gave something here so you don't pronate your foot, okay? Uh, and a really good shock-absorbing uh, shoe. One of the problems I found, because I used to test out shoes for Tennis Magazine, and the tennis industry, tennis court industry, has really gone to much lighter shoes, and it's not always the best thing, I think. Um, same thing with the running shoes. Um, you want a shoe that has enough support, especially if you're going to get heel problems. You want something that when you hit the, the bottom of the, uh, on the court that gives you enough uh, support and cushioning. Awesome. And and I do know that I and it, it's been mentioned. Um, actually, I know a couple of you maybe have gone over to the Tyro site. I think in the interim right now, they have uh, stopped doing some shipping. I know that there were some supply issues because the shoes were made uh, overseas. So I know that as we had talked with Kevin, uh, he thought there would be a slight interruption in shipping because they just they no longer have inventory or their inventory was diminished at this point in time, but I am sure they will be back as things start to change and our lives start to change. So, um, perfect. Let's see. All right. Um, and okay. So if you can, and we had a specific question about Tyrol, uh, do they have both outdoor and indoor shoes? Can you answer yes. that one, Alan? Sure. This is their uh, uh, old shoe, and one of the biggest problems was, in fact, you can see it, I don't know if you can see it here, but my, it, the surface from playing outdoors during the summer uh, months wore through. They put a new vibrant sole in I made a separate outdoor shoe. Um, this is the Striker, and I can't remember the name of the new shoe. It just escapes me for the second, but if you go to their website, you can see it. They're, they're definitely have made accommodations because uh, a lot of the players that I even gave some shoes to wore them out very quickly, but now they heard and they changed and made it a, an outdoor shoe. Better list. Perfect. So if it's not Tyrol, should people, let's talk about differences. I see a lot of people show up at the courts with running shoes on. I mean, not something you want to do, right? Right. Uh, because again, pickleball, tennis have a quite a different motion than uh, running. Running is a straight ahead motion. And now the running shoes aren't made with as much cushioning as they used to. Um, if you want to go to something other than a, a court shoe, you might want to try a, a, a basketball shoe. If you have ankle problems, that would be a good uh, 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 replacement. Badminton shoes for indoors would be fine. Um, but I would stay away from go a running shoe because what will happen is you'll end up twisting your foot and possibly causing an ankle sprain or even worse, fr a fracture. Yeah, or I, that I, perineal tendonitis can build up. It, it's scary when you see people come to the courts with um, running shoes on just because it can be so it is so unbalanced. I, mean, I don't live in florida but i've seen people on videos wear sandals and i just horrified oh not yeah. good not good for your feet not at all and i'm, I'm not <laughs> 
So if you got some more questions for Alan, go ahead and make sure that you put them over in the side. You can put a Q in front of that. Um, Alan, by the way, is on pickleball list. And so sometimes I, we have these great conversations and then we get to the end of the conversation and you're like, oh, but oh, I forgot to ask, and, and or you talk to somebody about it, whatever, and all these things come up afterwards. Uh, just want to make sure that you know you can engage with both of us over on a pickleball list and continue to ask questions and also to see some of the resources that Alan has on his site. He's got a blog with uh, some different, uh, why don't you tell him a little bit about some of the stuff that you have on your on your website. Well, I have a blog, and actually they can also go to my website. Uh, I have different blogs on there from anything from plantar fasciitis and how to treat it yourself, to hammer toes, to Achilles problems, to ingrown toenails, to athlete's foot, uh, you know, anything on the lower extremity. Um, they can go to my website, uh, which is www.allenrosenthaldpm.com, and uh, they can just look at the blogs or contact me through them also. And, and there are some, like Alan said, he's got a ton of free resources on there. If you wanted to do a telehealth visit, he also has a contact place that you can uh, contact him there. I think Dale has put uh, the link a couple times uh, for advanced uh, foot care, uh, um, advanced foot care center into the, uh, into the uh, chat. Uh, I just wanted to say, Mike LaFetch said he is using his new tie rolls tomorrow. They did take three weeks to arrive. Not a, not a surprise with things right now. Boy, I'll tell you, uh, it's get, getting anything right now is challenging. And thank you, by the way, to everyone who is still uh, working and who is bringing us the essential things. I know sometimes when you get Amazon and you expect us to have everything in two days and now all of a sudden it takes two weeks, it's it can be frustrating, but that's just kind of the new normal, at least for right now. So Alan, as we wind this up, uh, why don't you just tell everybody, let's wrap this up and tell them what are just, uh, just kind of a reminder of what they should be doing before they get back out on the court to stay healthy. Well, I think they should not only stretch the uh, lower extremity, but the upper extremity too, warming up properly, using the right equipment, meaning shoes, socks. Um, I would take it easy at the beginning. Um, you don't get enough time to, to play, especially if you're going to start off after playing doubles for most of the time and you're playing skinny singles. Uh, I think the wise thing would be to Go at it a little bit slowly at the beginning. And if you have foot issues or lower extremity issues, seek out help from a professional. Perfect. So yes, we want you to be healthy because there's going to be so much uh, pickleball coming up. So Alan, I wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you for being here. We appreciate having I have, you. Here. I have one other thing. I do have a Facebook page too under my office. Uh, Advanced Foot Care Center. It's in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Perfect. So that's another source. Perfect. So you've got some great resources. Check out all those resources. Also, don't forget, uh, Dale put this in the show notes. Uh, there's uh, uh, videos that Alan and I have done over a period of time where he talks specifically and gets into detail about some of these things right here on the channel. So Alan, I would like to say thank you very much. Appreciate you being Thank you here. again. You are most <laughs> I welcome. I love it. You're most welcome. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today and hopefully you got a lot out of uh, uh, time with Alan. He is fantastic and he knows his stuff and he does stay safe out there as you get back onto the pickleball courts. Just a couple of things we will be having again next week. We've got Coach Donnie B coming in and talking about uh, what it's like to feel good again. And then on the 19th of May, we've got Dave the Badger Weinbach coming back. So we hope that you join us there and you know how I always end these things. I'm grateful that you spent some time together because together we can train smart, live bold, and age well. Bye-bye, everybody.